All right, in this episode, we're gonna to put together a phi game plan. We're gonna take a look at the ultimate equation, what you earn minus what you spend. We're gonna analyze the difference, the gap, and then we're going to establish some rules around what to do with it and then how that maps out to your financial independent state. It's a fantastic exercise. And frankly, it's an exercise that all of us need to go through. We should be doing this. It creates a baseline that we can then build on top of. And to help me with this, uh, I'm going to be doing this with Corinne. She was previously featured in episode 243 of our podcast. You can find that at chooseify.com slash 243, where she worked with Jillian Johnsrud to do some goal setting. We're going to take a look at those goals. And then now we're going to wrap these financial independence numbers around them. With that, welcome to Choose FI. All right, everyone, I'm really excited to get a chance to hop in on uh, one of our Households of Fi coaching series. I'm going to be working with Corinne today. We're going to be taking a look at her budget. This is not her first coaching call. In fact, in episode 243, she had this incredible chat with Jillian Johnsrud, the host of Everyday Courage, and it was taking a look at what are your goals. And I think it's the right order. The, the math, I'm going to be honest with you. If you understand the tenets, it's kind of easy. I'm not saying that this isn't a very important conversation. In fact, it's probably where most people that find this show, it's where they start. But pretty quickly after you get into it, you realize that while the math is simple, the math is going to change depending on your goals. And so it's really important to start with, well, what do you want? What does your ideal day look like? Ultimately, this is not financial independence is not about having the most money. It's about building a better life, having more options. And Corinne in that episode stated that explicitly. The goal for her is not to go sit on a beach drinking pina coladas and never have to think about work or money again. Rather, it is community. It is options. It's being able to design her future. And in that episode, Jillian and Corinne were able to workshop a few of those pain points and those pain points in current COVID era times where her work structure as an accountant at a firm on the track to partner have not been derailed, but things have shifted, shifted underneath her. And on the track that she's in, she's in line for a partnership at some point. What does she want? Does a partnership mean that she's going to be working 90 hours a week for crazy amounts of money, but have no time? Is there a balance that can be pursued? How will that affect her path to financial independence? And while she's working towards financial independence, is her budget where it needs to be? It's a very individual question. There's no one perfect budget. There's no one perfect life, but there is probably a perfect path for an individual. So they were able to kind of troubleshoot, well, what do you want? We're going to be building on that conversation now, and I'm very excited to get a chance to explore this. So Corinne, with that, welcome back to the Choose a Five podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. All right. So first of all, one of my favorite things is just a little bit of accountability. So when you and Jillian talked, y'all work through, hey, I just said y'all. That, I don't know where that came from. I know, I know hey, you're, living in, I know you're living in Gainesville and that's what happened. That's what <laughs> it just came back. felt natural. We're sharing, sharing a moment here. Um, all right. So when you and Jillian talked, I know that you, I know that you uh, had, were given a couple tasks, not only to prepare for that episode, things that you were able to bring to the conversation, but also based on the conversation, you went and had a few things that you were going to be working on, but in your personal life. And I'm curious, you know, just for our audience to catch them up, when you came away from that call, what were the two or three big things that you said, I need to focus on this and have you taken action on those ideas? Yeah. So I got a lot out of the conversation with Jillian. And I think probably the biggest thing for me that she kind of helped me with and talking about was talking about how to build good habits and kind of specific strategies that I can use to really get closer to the goals that I want. So an example she used is even for something as simple as meditation. That sounds really easy. You know, she said, if you're struggling to do that, you know, set a timer on your phone. And, you know, when that timer goes off, you meditate for a minute, you know, and then maybe that minute becomes two minutes and different things like that. So one of the things that I've taken away from talking to her is I have a ton of reminders on my phone now for like everything that I have goals for. So whether it's calling my mom or whether it's updating my budget or whether it's doing a meditation or reading a book, you know, I have those reminders that pop up, whether it's daily, weekly, monthly, whatever it is. So I think that's been really good for me because it kind of forces me to hold myself accountable and it doesn't require me to just remember everything I want because when you have a hectic schedule, something is going to get lost in the shuffle. So that's been really helpful for me. Yeah. I mean, we all, there's this idea and it's true that we're all creatures of habit. A better way of framing it is Dominic Cortuccio, when he's talking about design your future, basically says 
we live most of our lives in this drift state and like only 1% of our day, 1% of our life, 1% of our actions are intentional. The rest of it is just our subconscious kind of taking over. And we go through the same routines, these same habits over time. The challenge that Jillian gave you, just give it two minutes. Can you do two minutes is really powerful because it allows us to activate, just give ourselves a chance to activate that 1%. But what I thought she did that really was an important observation that I've missed in the past is if you say, if your 1% self says, just do it for two minutes, but then you resist that, she said, explore that. Like, mm -hmm. be a little bit curious. Why is that resistance there? What, spend a little bit of time there. And I tell you, as I was listening to y'all's coaching episode, I, I was supposed to be, I had made this goal to go for a run, to go work out, and I wasn't. And I, I literally, while I'm, I'm listening to the episode, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go do two minutes. And I, that ended up turning into 30 or 40. But I thought of all the times I say these things are important to me and I say I want to do them in a vacuum. I'm this place. Yes, my goal is to get up every day at 5 a.m. And it's to go do this and it's go do this and it's do that. And then you just don't. But like you don't explore that. You just say, oh, not today. Like what if you gave yourself two opt out, you know, two easy things. One, I only have to do two minutes. And in fact, building on James Clear's Atomic Habits book, there's something really powerful to that. What if you said you're not allowed to do three? You're not allowed to do four. I don't care how much you want to. Right now, you're just proving that you will go to that 1% place. You'll do two minutes. And then if you're like, I'm not even willing to do that, well, let's spend five minutes exploring that. What is it about your subconscious that is sabotaging your long-term goals over and over and over again? And not about your exercise habits or your meditation habits, but maybe this is about your purchasing habits. Maybe this is about... Something where you just always say yes when every aspect of you wants to say no because you know it's not in your best interest, but you keep doing it. Let's explore that a little bit further. Um, one other thing that it sounded like you guys spent a fair amount talking about was like you're crushing it in your job. You are a high performer. Your agency, you're, you're, you're an accountant and you're on track for partner. You're in that lane. But there's some conflict there about what do you, what is the life that you want to build because there's some expectations that come with partnership and there's a way things have always been done. And there's not necessarily 100% alignment between what you want and maybe what those expectations are. And so I believe you guys spent a little bit of time workshopping what would it look like? Have you spent any more time there and do you see a lane for you to be able to end up in a situation where you can have both. You can have your dream job, you know, like, like you, you, you're going to get a job that you would never want to retire from. Is there a path? Yeah. So I did work on that. And one of the exercises that she had gave me for homework before our call was kind of doing that, writing down your ideal path and what would your ideal day look like and everything like that. And so I have been really conscious over the past month or two to pay attention at work to the things that energize me and the things that drain my energy and kind of just noting those and writing them down. And I think I've been doing a pretty good job of trying to manufacture my day to look like, you know, the best kind of day, the days that make me want to get up and go to work and do, you know, do my job. I think, you know, that's never going to be a hundred percent of the time, right? I mean, there's always going to be days where you just don't want to do it, but I have seen a difference in terms of kind of being able to be more focused on the things that I really enjoy and kind of learning how to delegate um, some of the things that I don't get as much, you know, fulfillment out of. Um, and I've also, you know, had some conversations with some of my mentors and advisors at the office. And I have gotten a lot of support in terms of people telling me, you know, you don't have to work, you know, 2,500 hours a year or whatever it is, you know, it's kind of just a decision. If you want to be the highest earning partner, then yeah, you're going to have to work a ton of hours. But there's a difference between the highest earning partner and partner. Like, like, the, sure. like, you know, where they're not saying if you want to be a partner, you have to work. They're just saying if right. you want to be the highest paid partner, this is what it's going to look like. Right. And like, there is like a minimum expectation, but I, that's not, you know, really an issue. I think it's just more we all kind of put the pressure on ourselves to work so much because we see everyone else doing it. But at the end of the day, it's reminding yourself that it is a choice and everything in life is a choice and you can choose, you know, what kind of balance you want to have in your life. And if working less hours means making a little less money, but being happier in the grand scheme of things, I think that's something that is, is doable. And, you know, I'm very fortunate to have a career where, you know, I do make good money and I, I have high earning potential. So it, it does give me a little more wiggle room to be able to kind of decide, you know, how hard do I want to push it? And that can change, you know, maybe in a certain season of my life, I'm like, I'm gung ho right now. And I'm just gonna, you know, work my butt off 
And then, you know, maybe there comes a time where it's like, right, I need to dial it back a little bit. So having that leeway to be able to do that is, is really, really nice. Awesome. You know, one thing I was listening to the episode with you guys that struck me is this kind of prioritizing your priorities and also this idea of making time. I'm kind of using our conversation and Jillian's with you as kind of a springboard for audience members. There's something about your story, your pain point that resonated with them, something they're going through right now. And I just would like to, when possible, point back to other episodes where we've really done deep dives on uh, deep dives on some of these. And one of them, uh, episode 168 of our podcast. So with any of these numbers that I'm giving, you can just go to choosefi.com slash three digit number. So in this case, 168, we had the opportunity to interview John Zaratsky, the author of Make Time. And if for those of us that have kind of felt like the week is a blur, the month is a blur, we just don't remember what happened and, and nothing that we did lit us up. The idea behind Make Time is that we can start to craft we, get, we can take a look at what actually lights us up and we can build these highlights throughout our week that actually make uh, each week more memorable, more, enjoy, more enjoyable. And, and as a result of doing this, we can start to spend less time on the meaningless. Like if you're spending throughout your day, you're checking your email 20 or 30 times a day. Think about the cost, the mental switching cost of doing that as opposed to, let me just batch this. I check my email in between 1030 and 11. And I check my email between 3.30 and 4 or pick a longer window if you're, you have a massive email responsibility. You batch these specific tasks and you look at these things like infinite scrolls, like on your phone where you can do Twitter forever, Facebook for Twitter, you swipe to the left and you've got Google news updates forever. Like you might think you're being productive, but all you've done is gone through the first three pages of your Google updates. You're updating for what? What could possibly be on Google updates that you actually need to know and you're sacrificing your happiness in the meantime? So it's kind of little things like that. Like what would it look like for us to reclaim our time in the process and realize we actually do have more bandwidth than we think and re-energize ourselves while we're on the path to FI. Now, you've actually transitioned us perfectly here. We're going to talk about the finances a little bit because that's something that you're, you're uh, this is the point that you're at right now. You're open to the idea of financial independence. You're making a lot of the right moves, but you'd like somebody just to kind of take a look over your shoulder and say, you know, where am I maybe more objectively? Like, I feel like I'm doing good. Where am I objectively and where could I make some improvement? So let's start with just this very simple equation. You got what you earn minus what you spend is equal to this difference. And I know you can't see my handwritten notes, but I'll have it on the screen for you for later. Um, what you earn minus what you spend is equal to this difference or, or we'd like a gap. So if you're paycheck to paycheck, unfortunately, that means there's no gap. That's a problem, but you do have a gap. So let's talk a little, little bit about that. Uh, what is your, what is, you're an accountant and how many years of experience do you have? Um, I have almost 10 years. You're 10 years in. What's your income? It's right now it's 120,000. That's amazing. And is that pretty typical for an accountant in your particular, what, what, what is your specialty? Your personal accountant, corporate? What, what do you do? So I'm a little bit unique. I work with nonprofit organizations and I work in different segment lines. So most people will pick either, you know, audit and assurance or tax or what have you, but I, I do both. Um, and I also do outsourced accounting and controllership services. So it is a little bit of a unique model, but our firm is a, you know, fairly typical local CPA firm. So I think, you know, for our region, at least, I think that's probably pretty typical of someone in a senior management position. I think sharing this sort of information is really important for people that are thinking about career tracks. Let's talk about the career track that got you to a six figure income. So this was a four year degree. It's a bachelor's degree. Is that accurate? Uh, yes. And then I did, I did a five year program where I got my bachelor's and my master's because to take your CPA exam, you have to have a certain amount of course requirements anyways. So that was just kind of the easy way for me to go. Did you graduate with student loan debt? No, I did not. Oh, wow. And so was that the Bright Scholarship or? Yeah, I had the 100% Bright Future Scholarship. And then um, my parents paid for my housing locally. And then I did some, you know, student assistant work and TA work and stuff like that just to cover living expenses. Very cool. So Florida resident here. There's some more stuff there. We'll get to that when we start talking about state taxes in a little bit. But the Bright Scholarship, how does, how do individuals, and I think it's Florida and Georgia has another variation, maybe a couple other states, but just for audience that are hearing this for the first time, is it common knowledge in Florida that this is a thing? Uh, yes, it is. And it's changed since I was in college. Um, so I'm not quite familiar with what the current structure of it is. But yeah, it's a pretty well known scholarship program. Very cool. Okay, so uh, you graduate your five year program. And what do you think if you were graduating right now from this five year program, what would someone going into your industry make out the gate in a similar track or lane? That's a good question. I'm guessing it's probably going to be somewhere in the 50,000 yep. area. Um, if I had to guess. Yep. 
So you're starting out around 50K. And, and would you identify this as just making 6 to 8% raises year over year? Was there anything that got you that you did that got you to 120? Because you've done really well. You've doubled your income, more than doubled your income over this 10-year stint, which is incredible. Mm -hmm. You're a high performer that's coming through. And was this all with one company? Like, how did we go from 50 to 120? What do you attribute that to? Yeah, so it actually has been all with one company. And I did some internships there where I was in college. So that kind of got me a good relationship with the the people there and had a job offer coming out of college, which was great for me at the time, the job market was a little difficult. Um, so that was nice. Um, and I think for me, what has gotten me to where I am is definitely work ethic is part of it, but also just being willing to be a little conventional and outside of the box and kind of figure out where I can excel. You know, for me, um, I'm not maybe the technically strongest person in the world. You know, I'm not that person who could study the night before the test and get an A. Um, Neither but I. I think what, I don't know if I can study three nights in a row and get an A. It's, yeah, a, it's a lot no. of stress, a lot of work to get A's on my part. <laughs> yeah, me too, for sure. And so I think that's what, what I realized pretty quickly about myself is that I was going to have to narrow my focus if I wanted to excel. And so that's where, um, you know, kind of going to my mentors and advisors again and kind of saying, Hey, I'm really enjoying working with these nonprofit clients. Can I specialize in this industry? so that I really only have to learn one industry, understand those rules really well, and just be an expert at it. Um, so that has really helped me. It's kind of made me, again, like a am viewed as an expert in that space. Yeah. So that's made me valuable in that regard and has really helped me in my career trajectory. That's fantastic. All right. So I wanted to talk both to you and, and to other individuals, because you mentioned a little bit about this, about getting feedback from your mentors. And I wanted to point out just the fact that you have mentors, you've identified people that are a little bit farther ahead, maybe at pace, a little bit farther ahead, and they are giving you this feedback. Like, hey, you might want to go over here. There's going to be an opportunity. You might want to mm -hmm. steer your, I can see the threats if you do this. Like, this is something that like you've kind of figured out the earn more piece. You have more than doubled your income over a 10 year period while staying at the same company. Many people are getting less than 3% cost of living adjustments by making that choice to stay at the same company. What do you like, is that, would you attribute most of that to becoming an expert in a niche? And then would you attribute that to mentors guiding you towards the sweet spots? Like kind of help me navigate that a little bit. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really good question. I think there's a lot of different ways to do it. And I think in our industry, in the public accounting industry, there are very clearly defined roles. So when you get promoted into a role, you know, there is a salary range for that role. So I think your ability to increase your income is dependent on your ability and desire to want to progress and to take on more responsibility. So it doesn't necessarily have to be in a certain area, but you have to be good enough and um, hardworking enough to be able to move up that ladder. You know, there is a situation where if you decide, you know what, I don't want to progress any further, then you'll probably start just getting those cost of living raises more or less at that point. But as you continue to move up, move up that ladder, then there's going to be bigger jumps in there. So I think that's probably the biggest part of it. And then Beyond that, it just kind of becomes, you know, kind of what I was talking to Jillian about is however many hours you're willing to work is how much money you're going to make. So then it becomes more of a decision of, okay, how, how much time do I want to put into it? Where's the marginal utility of that next right. hour or that next dollar and kind of trying to figure that out. All right. Now let's talk about the partner track a little bit, because that was part of one of your aspirational goals. When you started as an accountant, did you even realize that like partner track was a thing? Was that on your radar? I knew it was a thing because they were my boss, um, but I didn't really understand how it all worked. I didn't really say, oh, I want to make partner in 10 years or whatever it is. You know, some people are very gung ho and they know exactly what they want. I had always kind of taken my career in, in two to three year blocks and said, you know, if I'm still liking it after two years, I'm going to stick around and kind of have just kept re-upping on that um, because I've, you know, I have really enjoyed it. I'm fortunate to work at a great firm with really great people, which makes a huge difference. Um, but I think, the nice thing is there are a lot of different options. So if I didn't want to be a partner, it's not an up or out mentality. So I did kind of consider that. I said, okay, do I really want to go to the partner track or do I want to um, go the other route, which they call a director route, um, which you kind of level off and become more of a, like a technical expert and you still assist clients and everything. But I think what really intrigues me about the partner role is, is having an ownership in the business and really, you know, I've always wanted to be a business owner. And I think that's such a cool goal. And just having that ability to kind of influence, you know, the way the 
the company is run and, you know, taking care of the people and the clients and everything. That's kind of my biggest motivation in that regard. And obviously the financial incentive is nice too. There's definitely a much higher earning potential um, once you get into that ownership role. Well, let's talk just a little bit about that. So, you know, as an accountant, you, the, the monetization at the, for the most part, as an individual, you are billing some particular hourly rate and, and a portion of that has to cover overhead for the company has to cover maybe partner fees, et cetera. But then a portion of that is yours. I would imagine as a partner, maybe you get a higher percentage of your billable hours plus maybe some overall percentage of the profitability of the company. Is that, is that close? More or less. Yeah. I mean, there's a very complicated formula that I'll be completely honest. I don't entirely understand. Um, but it basically is, you know, the more revenue that the company has, then the more that's going to be left over to split between the partners based on their respective books of business. So it's, it's more or less a function of that's driven by the revenue of the company and then the expenses of the company and what's left over the pot kind of gets divided based on how each partner has their, has their business broken out. And that partner, uh, that partner, so that ownership stake that you get, that percentage of profitability, is that only coming to you while you are an active partner in the company? Let's say you're 60, 70 years old, you're tiring, you're done, you're stepping away. Do you sell your shares? What's the exit strategy for a partner or is it just, all right, this is yours for life? They do have payouts um, after retirement. And again, that's something that I'll be completely honest, I haven't um, totally understood the formula for yet, but it is something where it's it's not really like a, like a buy-in buy-out like a traditional partnership it's structured a little differently um so you do get you do get some retirement payouts after you retire cool now you can see why as part of a five plan it might be interesting for us to know like all right if i follow the traditional track and i'm in this role for the next 20 years i'm 10 in now and i have a 30-year career with this company at the end of 30 years when i'm done because I've met the certain criteria, there is the equivalent of a pension that comes to me as you know this partner role, like that's going to change our financial independence number. So it might be just on your checklist. You don't need to be a world master at understanding how this formula is calculating, but as it becomes increasingly a reality that this is the trajectory you're on, mm -hmm. you would probably wanna know, like how is this going to, if I can rely on this income, how is this going to affect what I need to actually save for retirement? So that's why we're exploring that a little bit. And it doesn't sound like you have that and you don't need to, but it certainly will affect your retirement yeah. number. So you'll want to start thinking about that. Okay. So we covered your income. So we have 120 K and gross. And let me just ask as part of your, uh, I mean, I'm sure your company offers health insurance, how much we'll start working through your expenses, but is that, you know, how, how much of that compensation goes towards like health insurance, that sort of thing? Or is that on top of the 120? So yeah, that's the, the 120 is my salary. Um, in terms of benefits, um, we get an allotment for insurance. So I don't remember the exact amount they gave me, but it's basically like you get, let's say $400 a month worth of stuff and you go in your little basket and pick whatever you want. So the majority of mine is covered. I have um, regular, I have health insurance for a single person. I have dental insurance, vision insurance, and teledoc. And I think I'm paying maybe like, you know, 20 bucks a yeah. month or something out Great. of my pocket. Great. So the 120 is after benefits. You have, you have, you have about 120 is your, mm -hmm. all right. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. We'll go back to Florida. Uh, we'll take a look at the Florida state tax in just a second. You can probably quote it from memory for me as an accountant. That's great. <laughs> but, uh, let's, uh, let's, let's move on here. So in fact, actually, I think it's time. I want to know, basically what we want to know is we know your gross salary. It'd be nice to kind of whittle down to a net. I'm sure you could provide that for me, but as a useful exercise for our audience, I would suggest that we go to a website that I'm a huge fan of, and maybe you're familiar with it. Smartasset.com. Have you ever gone to that website before? No, I have not. All right. This one is a lot of fun. Uh, I can do a screen share on just for a second here, just so you can see it. Give me a second and we'll run this together. This is one of my favorite income tax calculators because most of them just work at the federal level. This one will actually incorporate your uh, local, state and local taxes in there as well. So what we're going to throw in there is your gross salary. And this doesn't have, we're not looking for hundred percent precision. We're just trying to see if we're getting it close. So we're going to say it's a household income of 120 and then we need to do your location. Which, and, and so what city are you in? I'm in Gainesville, Florida. All right. So Gainesville, Florida. So let's take a look at uh, your location. We have 120,000 of household income. We have Gainesville, Florida. Florida has a very favorable tax rate. I mean, you can you can highlight that. What is what is Florida state tax, Corinne? Uh, it's a lovely zero <laughs> percent. Gosh, those in California are like spitting out right now. Anyways, we'll come back to that. But there, but wait, there's more. So first of all, let's talk about this. So on 120,000 dollars. 
uh, filing single, your federal income tax plus FICA, so Social Security, your tax would be $30,000, $29,227. That would be your federal tax burden. But I know for a fact from listening to the episode with uh, with Jillian that you already max out your 401k, right? Is that is that correct? That is correct. Very good. So let's take that off the top. So we're going to take the 120,000 and then I think the max limits in 2020 what was that 195 this year, Corinne? Uh, yes. So 120,000 minus 19,500 means that your actual federal tax, your taxable income would be 100,000, 100, and five, $100,500. Wow. That just rolls right off the tongue. So let's now take a look at that. 100, thousand five hundred dollars filing single in florida so now your tax your federal income tax plus fica is twenty three thousand dollars so that one decision to max out your 401k you're just saying hey i'd like to save this money for later saved you over six thousand dollars in income tax that that money would have just been gone to the federal government to pay taxes but you're saying you know what i'd like to save this for my retirement and the government is effectively giving you know saying yeah great let's you control your tax rate that's fantastic now Converse, I want to add on to that though. There's more, again, her tax bracket looks very simple in Florida. There's a 0% state tax bracket there in other States like Virginia. I think it's like five all the way up to 8%. California, it goes even higher than that. Like Florida, Florida has some significant, significant tax benefits. So we just put a zero line item. So we're saying, you know, your federal tax plus your FICA, you're going to be taxed. You're going to have, you're going to have $23,000 in tax. Your income after all of your taxes with no state and no local taxes is going to be, and after maxing out your 401k, you're bringing home $77,445. For simplicity, for this example, what we'll use going forward is that you have 77500 net pay. Does that sound close to accurate? I think so, yeah. All right. It's enough for us to work on. There's plenty of rounding errors here, uh, but but it's enough for us to use. And let's just assume, for the sake of simplicity, that you get paid monthly. I, I, you probably don't, but let's just let's just assume that you did. And we'll I do pull- actually. Oh, fantastic! <laughs> wow, they're so considerate. Okay, so seventy-seven five hundred divided by twelve, you have about sixty-five hundred dollars a month to work with. Does that okay. sound close? Mm-hmm. $6,500 a month is what you're starting with. And you've already clarified for audience. You have already maxed out your 401k. So we'll come back to that in a second, but it's important that when we talk about our fine numbers, not to forget we're already making massive progress. So now that we know this is really where we're starting from 6,500 is what we have each month to budget. We got to figure out how much does our life actually cost? So let's go through the big ones for many people, for entrepreneurs, for me, I have to take a look at health insurance. Got to put that on there. But for you, it's basically a decimal rounding error, which we don't need to include it. So negligible. And the next big one though, for many people would be, and we already covered taxes that's taken care of. So now we probably need to look at your living situation, rent or mortgage. How much does your rent or mortgage cost per month on, on average? So I'm in the process of refinancing right now, Mm -hmm. but my payment, my mortgage payment is approximately a thousand dollars. All right. So well below, well below 25% of your take-home pay, 25%, which if you're starting to approach 50% of your take-home pay, you're going to start feeling a little tight, a little squeezed. You're well below 20, like 25% of 6,500 would be about what two would be about 1800, somewhere in that range, 16 to 1800, somewhere in there. So you're far, you're down there near a thousand. So you've already got a lot of space. And then how much for your groceries and your food bill? Um, it varies significantly, yes. but I would say and don't keep it tight. Like give yourself lots of rounding error here. We're not trying to, I'm not trying to force you in a box. I'm just saying if you were going to err on the side of giving yourself too much each month, you know, but it's kind of keeping it closely accurate. You're like, well, it's always, it's 90% of the time it's below this. What is that number? Yeah. It's usually less than 500, maybe 550. Okay. So we've got mortgage. We've got food. What about transportation? Do you have any car payments? Um, I don't have any car payments, so it's really just gas, which has been low lately because um, I'm working right. from home right now. <laughs> All right, so let's say let's say it's a hundred bucks a month on gas. Maybe that's probably way too high, but you know we also have maybe uh, state inspections, car mechanic problems, like all of which goes down. There's probably some extra stuff around the car, but but it wouldn't go over a hundred dollars a month, right? Car right. taxes. Ta- Does Florida have car tax laws that you pay? Yeah, we have to pay a tag fee. 
And is that, would that be covered by easily by a hundred dollars a month? Yeah. It's like 60 bucks a year. It's low. So, so I'm giving you too much here, but if at some point you have some sort of sliding expense, you have $1,200 a year. That's kind of in this general car maintenance, repair, gas fund. It's too much, but we won't, you know, it'll be fine. Um, mortgage, food, car, gas, utilities. So what comes to mind is, do you have property taxes on your mortgage that weren't included by, you know, the, the, the refinance deal or were your property taxes included in that thousand dollars a month? Yeah. So when I gave you that payment, that's what I actually pay. So it includes the um, escrow amounts in there. Fantastic. And then we have our basic utilities that we need to run through. So we've got our, our cell phone, we've got our internet, we have our cable package or, Hey, we cut the cable, but we added nine <laughs> entertainment on demand options, which in aggregate yep. add up to far more than our cable. You know, like what, what are those, do you have, do you group those together as kind of, you know, my, my living life on the internet expenses? Mm -hmm. So right now what I've been doing is kind of just downloading my credit card activity and going with kind of where they group things yep. um so i do have a bills and utilities section and that is around 375 400 okay perfect and then uh dining out entertainment uh mm -hmm. stuff i forgot to budget for like over the last couple months like yep. right now we've only added up right around we're still under two thousand dollars a month is there another do you think everything else could be bundled under five hundred dollars a month for the stuff that i missed did i miss anything big that we should be adding into this yeah. So for me, um, you know, the, the dining out and shopping together, um, is looking like it's probably going to be around 500. Um, but then I also do have, um, charity, like I budget in yep. my charity and that is varies between two around 200 a month, let's Great. say. Yep. And what else do I have on here? Oh, I didn't include my HOA in there. So hmm. that's going to be, 150 a month. Okay. All right. So, and is there anything else? I'm just thinking through my personal life. What about, do, do you have your home or do you rent? Are you fixing up your home? Do you find yourself throwing a lot of money at home maintenance, home renovations, home, what, you know, all these sorts of things, home decor, like, is that your, your, your weekly target run? Like, is there like a cadence to these extra Amazon prime expenses that we should just incorporate under stuff I forgot to budget for? Sort of. I mean, I do have the shopping budget. So all my Amazon and target okay. goes in there. I do, um, do housekeeping, which is a hundred dollars a month. Okay. Um, that's kind of my one home expense that doesn't really fall into any other category, I would say. Housekeeping 100 bucks a month. What about travel Do you, and, and vacations? And also, is there is there a line item here? I know travel right now, that's a joke, but generally. Yeah, generally, yeah, is normally, there... There, normally there would be, um, oh. but it's been pretty much nothing. But we don't um, want to account for this one isolated pandemic that seems to go on forever. We want to account for our life because this is right. a general strategy. So, you know, like that's why I said with the car, yeah, but at some point, are you going to drive again? Or have you decided to bike to work sure. forever or renegotiate? So let's get you a budget that doesn't just work during COVID, but like you stay under and you feel like it's realistic when life goes back to pseudo normal. And mm -hmm. so with your car, we'll keep that at a hundred bucks a month, just so we have some wiggle room here. And with travel, I mean, it, it, let's look at last year, the year before, did you try to do, you, you know, you, did you try to take two one week trips a year? Is that, do you like, are you aspiring to do more international travel as you have more time? Like, is there some amount that you would like to set aside? Because at some point you're going to, where you'd be nice to know, well, I'm not going to start saving on day right. zero when the trip's 10 days from now. I'm going to like, this is the money that I kind of have earmarked for this. Do you have any, yeah. any dollar amount there that come to mind? Um, so what I had hoped for, um, when I was doing a rough budget, I put about 3000 in there. I do want to start doing more traveling. 3000 um, a year. Yeah. Okay. All right. So now I'm just going to break that down. Cause again, monthly, right. Just for our monthly purposes. So 3000 divided by 12, we're at 250 bucks a month that we'd like to okay. set aside for some travel each month. That's great. You know, if you get to 3000, have to no time to use it. Maybe you stop budgeting for that going forward. Anything else? Like we're trying to, what we're trying to do here is not like present this perfect image of this perfect file life that doesn't have any random expenses. It's if everything's right. dialed in, then this is, I can spend, I can spend $700 a month and I got it nailed. No, we want to know what does your life actually look like? Cause these are, we're going to try to prevent ourselves from having to look at every single penny. We're going to try to create an anti-budget. We're going to try to create something that we just don't need to look at. Super difficult. As long as we know we stay under these amounts, we're good. We're on the path. 
Um, have we missed anything? We try. We went from the core. Now we've added in dining and shopping and Amazon and Target and charity and our HOA and our housekeeping. And we want to travel and we want to take vacations. And I feel pretty good about these numbers. I don't see any gaping holes, but do you want to add anything to this? Um, I don't think anything specific. The only thing I can think of just looking at my activity is I do have like random Venmo activity. So it might not be a bad idea to just put in like kind of a random hundred dollars a month or something just for whatever you want to call it. Odds and ends, unbudgeted items, kind of like you said. Let's call it 200 a month because there's probably something else that we missed. So, all right. (laughs) And you've got some room. I just want to point out, you've got some room here. Let me do the math on what we just said. So uh, I'm just putting this on my cell phone. I just try to keep this super low tech and simple. We have a thousand for our mortgage. We have 500 for food. We've got 100 for this car and gas. It's a giant paperweight right now. We've got our utilities through our building that are 375 that adds up our internet, our cell phone, maybe our cable or, or whatever. We've got dining out and shopping that we're capping at below 500 a month. We've got 200 that we carve out for charity each month. We've got an HOA fee at $150 a month. We've got housekeeping at $100 a month. We've got travel one day at $250 a month. And we got stuff I forgot to budget for at $200 a month, bringing our total cost of living to, wait for it, da, 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 drum roll, $3,375. That's, your, that's, your, that's a very comfortable number for you to live, maintain your current life without any deprivation, any sacrifices. That's not budgeting. That's just saying my observation over my last three months is my life cost around, on average, $3,375 a month. It probably doesn't cost that, but when I budget that amount aside, I say pay myself, like, you know, make sure this is landing there. Then down the road, when something's more expensive, the money is there to actually handle that. So are we, does that, do, do you think we did this in a fair way up to this point? Are we on the same page? I think we're pretty close. Like it looks like my net expenses that I'm showing for the past several months hover around that area. I mean, there's a pretty wide variety from month to month, but that seems like actually a really reasonable average. Perfect. And that's all we want. We want an average. Life is lumpy. Life will never follow your exact prescripted rules. We're just trying to, at this point, this is an observation stage. Look, there's sometimes when your hair is on fire, debt is eating away at you. You've got to reel everything and you've just scrap every penny. You cannot afford to stay at paycheck to paycheck. We've got to get some space and recognizing that is really important because you would hear me say do we really need to spend that at this at this time but like the goal is not for you to be that worried about every single penny for the next 5 10 15 years like and that's not your situation you actually have right now observed if i were to double what you're spending you're still like right now after you max out your 401k you have you're you have 6500 left over if you double your expenses, you're just barely crossing that. So you're already at a 50% savings rate, not even including what you're maxing out with your 401k. Let's observe the actual gap. So we're going to take 6,500, which is what we calculated is your, uh, your net pay right now, 6,500. And we're going to subtract this, you know, super rough number that we just came up with and say 3,375. That leaves us with a difference of $3,125 a month. And this is where, in my mind, it gets fun. This is where I really like the idea of if these numbers are reliable, if they've been tested over time, and if we have just a little bit of money set aside already, I would just make one simple decision that I'm just going to put this money to work for me. I'm not going to wait to spend it or see what's left at the end of the month. I'm going to try to take like a YNAB model where I'm living on last month's paycheck. So like the money I made last month is the money that I'm living off this month. Does that make sense? All my money is at least 30 days old. And then as soon as that next $6,500 check hits my bank account, the first thing I do is I send $3,125 to my investment strategy, whatever that is. We can talk about that in just a second. Hmm. And then from there, I know the rest of it's covered. I've got one month of expenses. I probably have some small emergency set aside for unexpected larger expenses, but I'm only making one big decision. And that is just to get that 3125 toward my goals as quickly as possible. And then we'll worry about it next time. And that's how you can get your life down from spending hours and hours worrying about it to know just this is what we do. I know these numbers work. I give myself free permission to reevaluate every six months if I need to scale it up, dress it down. If I make more, I get a raise, like all these other things. But like budgeting could be that simple once you're out of the hair is on fire stage and you've got the earn more part figured out and you understand what your life costs. It's really important to understand what your life costs, not because I want you to track it every single month, month, month. If you use software like YNAB that's doing it for you, great. I feel very happy with that sort of compromise. I like to make these observations and see when something goes off the rails, but I don't really look at it from a critical standpoint anymore as much as just to kind of give me a peace of mind and say, this is the gap and I want to put this gap that I'm projecting that won't 
put me in a deprived state. I want to put it to work as quickly as possible. Does that resonate with you? How does that sound? Yeah, I love that. I mean, that makes it way easier. And I feel like before I just kind of grabbed a random number to put into my recurring, you know, savings deposit, because I had no idea how much it is. So to see that gap is, is really cool to know that I actually could be putting in more. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's big. It's big. So now with that, so I'm going to move all my document. I'm sorry. You'll be able to see my notes later. Hopefully this will make sense. I'll show it all to you. But, um, now that we've done that, let's take a look at like where you are. So we're on this we're on this plan for financial independence. So we've covered your income, we've covered your expenses, we've covered the gap. Now we need to take a look at the lay of land from a net worth perspective. So what you've been maxing out your 401k at least the last year or so. What is your current net worth in your investment account specifically? I, I'm that that that's what I'm kind of interested in. What is your what is your invested net worth? In my 401k mm-hmm. or in my taxable account? Great. Too. Let's do let's split them up. So your 401k first. So, um, I haven't checked it recently, but I'm not super worried about the volatility. It's just, what do you think it might be right now? Yeah. Um, somewhere around 150 ish. All right. So we have 150 K in our 401 K. So you've already passed that first 100 K mark. The first hundred K is truly the longest, hardest slog to get there. Once you're at that point, you can kind of start to watch compounding really working for you, which is kind of cool. What about in your taxable accounts? So my taxable accounts, I have about another hundred K. Awesome. All right. So right now we're at 250 K. So what is your current age? 32. 32. Nice job. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. Okay. So, uh, let's now just run a very simple phi calculation. So I showed you my screen for this, uh, I choose a phi. We actually built just a very simple phi calculator, uh, that does the calculation that I like to do for this sort of thing. And we just want to basically present a simple projected out, uh, future value calculation. So it's nothing fancy here. Let me see. It's either this, when you go to apps.chooseify.com and you click on the calculators option, there's two of them. And I'm trying to remember it's either the retirement projection or the future value of investment. We're going to go with the, uh, the retirement one for right now. I'm pretty sure this is it. So on this screen, is this look okay? Can you see it? Yes. Cool. We're going to put your current age and then, uh, we are going to set out, let's see, we could put a retirement age. Now you don't really have any plans to retire early, but it would be interesting Let's act, let's actually take a step back. It would be interesting to know how much you need. If assuming mm-hmm. that your life were to stay the same, what would your number need to be for you to never have to worry about earning another dollar and yeah. know that you're good to go? So this is also a very simple calculation. So what we're going to do is we're going to take your actual monthly cost of living, which was three, three, seven, five, and we're going to multiply it times 12. So your life costs $40,000 a year, 40 a year. And we're going to take that number, 40,500, we're going to multiply that times 25. Your phi number to be at a point where you could maintain your current cost of living and inflation adjusted dollars. If you had just over a million dollars in your investment account, $1,012,500, you don't ever even need to earn another dollar again. Now, I'm not telling you that you have to do that, but just from a peace of mind security, you could have the exact same life that you have right now without ever worrying about income again, once you see your invested net worth reach just about that million dollar threshold, which is pretty awesome. And you're already 25% of the way there, which as we just said, the first 100,000 is really the hardest. Like the thing actually starts working faster on your behalf. Um, Just a cool thing about compounding, right? At some point your money is actually working harder than you are. And so you're probably actually farther than 25% objectively. And we can kind of prove that out a little bit here. So let's take your starting balance. Uh, let's see. Actually, you know what? I'm going to go back to the future value one. I'm going to go to future value of investment one because we don't really care about your retirement age at this point. We want to know if you are starting out with $250,000 invested and we make an average 8% return. That's the one that you hear and I, Brad and I use. It's optimistic, but it's not unrealistic. It's very reasonable to use an 8%. And we don't need to get in the weeds on whether or not it's inflation adjusted or not at this point. It's We're doing very rough back of the envelope calculations. And we can reassess over time what we need to do, especially with the short timeline that you're going to need to pull this off. And uh, we're saying we're starting today. So we have $250,000 today. We're making an 8% return. We just basically want to run this. How long do we need? How long do we need to get to that number $1,012,000, assuming are we going to make any additional contributions, right? So we already talked about you're going to be making a contribution of $31,25, and you're going to be making this contribution monthly. So how long do I need to get to $1,000,000? And we'll keep playing with this. I suspect you'll be there in less than 10 years. 
but oh, and actually, it's better than that. I actually, I'm, I'm not, I'm doing you a disservice. So 31.25 was just what you're doing on the taxable side. You are actually also on top of that doing the 19,500 a year on the other side. So let's go ahead and add that in as well. So we do this uh, right. So 19.5, 19.5 divided by 12. So we're going to add another 16.25 to that 31.25. 31.25. So you're actually right now, if you use this strategy, your total invested amount each month will be $4,750. That's what you're investing each month right now. That's your additional contribution. So this is what we're going to put here. Now, a person could be crit critiquing this saying, well, yeah, but some of that's pre-tax. Some of it's not. Yeah. This is rough. We don't, it doesn't matter at this point. We can talk about those strategies. You're actually gonna have a lot of options because you're gonna have so much in your taxable accounts. You are the, if you really wanted to crush the tax code, not only are you already in Florida, but you would be the prime example for someone that could pull off a Roth conversion ladder. Like it could totally happen. So we don't need to really worry about that. We have whole episodes on Roth conversion ladders, but I wouldn't even worry about it. When I'm doing my financial independence mapping, we're not actually talking about drawdown strategy. We're just talking about projections and simple math to get to this point. This is all I would incorporate at this stage. So again, for our audience, we have $250,000 starting principal. We're starting today with that net worth. We're expecting over a period of time to make a roughly 8% return. This is the goal here in terms of the investment strategy. This isn't dependent on what Tesla does or what Apple does. We're just trying to keep up with the market as a whole. This is using low cost broad based index funds and over any 30, 40 year period, they've done somewhere between eight to 10%. Again, that's looking at past performance, but it seems realistic for us to use that going into this calculation. And then we're seeing how long does it take to get to roughly a million dollars? We're starting this calculation at 10 years. Let's see what our net worth based on this uh, analysis will be in 10 years. In 10 years, you'll be well past that number. You'll actually be at $1.4 million. So we're saying, well, actually, well, then, well, crap. Ten, I'm already, I'm within 10 years of striking distance. What about, what about eight years? That's a great question. Let's look at that. Uh, yep, you'll be there in eight years. Uh, let's look at seven years. You will almost be there in seven years. So you're seven years away from never needing to earn another dollar again. And then again, the number I came up with in seven years was $969,393. You're like, well, that's a little bit short. Look, we don't know what the future is going to hold, but we know in, in seven years, based on you just living your life and doing your thing and not worrying about this, you're going to be so freaking close to financial independence. It's not going to matter right? Like you're, and on top of that, you're going to be a partner. Your earning potential is probably, that's assuming you never made another raise. You're yeah. already on track for partner. What are the odds that seven years from now, you're just making exactly what you're making today when you're already crushing it. You're probably, this is probably seven years is probably underselling this. You'll probably be there in five to six. And that yeah. is the power of kind of understanding how much your life costs. This is not about deprivation, but it's like, all right, look at the options I have as a result of knowing what my life cost and focusing on both sides of the equation. Like you could all, you could focus on the frugality and I want you to, to a point. I want you to start there every single time. If something's blatantly wrong, you are spending 50, 60% of your income on your housing. You are spending $400 a month on your cell phone and cable package. You are spending $800 a month on your car. Let's get some easy wins. You're struggling just to survive. But once you're already at thriving, let's just figure out how to optimize and build a life that we can get excited about. Not just seven years from now, from now, but no, do your life and do everything you do. Make your choices based on the confidence that you've already got this. It's just a mathematical certainty. So Karim, what do you think? I know I just ran it there, but it's because I'm very excited about your financial situation. What do you, what's your feedback on that? That's so cool. Yeah, I definitely, like I haven't run that before. And I think to your point, I kind of thought that if I wanted to get there in less than 10 years, I was going to have to be eating rice and beans and like living in a shack. But it's very cool to see that like just living your normal life and being reasonable and like monitoring it, you can you can still make it happen. Yeah, so that's awesome. That's cool. All right. All right. What do you what? I don't know. What do you think? What if someone's hearing this? What's your big takeaway uh, for our audience after kind of going through this this thought experiment? I mean, for me, that's just like so energizing. Like, I feel, I feel like I was like nervous to run all the numbers because I didn't want to see like how long it was going to take. But it's actually like so much more motivating to see like, okay, here's how much my life costs and not being judgmental about it. Just being like, all right, here's how much everything costs. Like, then I can look to see if there's some areas I can cut back on if I want to. But even if I don't, like, just be smart and take that extra money and put it somewhere. And that's my next step is like, instead of letting it sit in a savings account is making sure that I'm actually putting that amount, you know, where it can grow and do the work for me. So I think that's probably my next step that I need to focus on. Awesome. 
All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing kind of your insight and your, your, your personal numbers with us. I mean, it's, it, it, it's so much more fun when you can see actual numbers and just prove this is just simple math. Like we just did this on a couple of free calculators. There was nothing fancy here. There's nothing to be incorporated. We get, when you get a little bit closer and we're actually looking at tax strategies and drawdown and all these sorts of things, like, yeah, it's going to get more complicated. We're going to have to figure out, let's say you did make a decision at some point to walk away from your amazing corporate job and you did it before Medicare kicked in. And now you're thinking, all right, well, as an individual, what is going to be the cost of health care? You know, what, there are certainly other considerations. This is not the end of the conversation, but certainly I wouldn't let all those considerations slow me down just from living my life. Like I would just get started. There's no scenario where five or six years from now you have a million dollars based on this math. And you're like, gosh, I wish I wish I hadn't learned about financial independence. That really, <laughs> that really set me back. Gosh, no, 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 just do it. So, all right, Corinne, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you for having me. All right, everyone. I hope you see how valuable this is and why you need to go through this exact exercise today. Rewatch it, make sure that it makes sense and just map it out. Find out where you are. If it felt over your head and you're just, you felt a little bit lost as you were watching it, let me encourage you to check out our free five-day challenge. Now, this is our kind of on-ramp to this idea of financial independence. Get Rich Quick is usually a scheme that ends up with your money in someone else's pocket, but you can, you know, get rich quick-ish over an intermediate time period, basically every time by implementing some basic rules, by understanding how this game of life is played and then crushing the game. So if that sounds interesting, if you would like to get started on your own path to financial independence, go to choosefi.com slash start. We put all the information there to help you get on ramp to your own path to financial independence. And I've got a link for that right up here, maybe there, probably here. All right, the fire is spreading. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled.